And good evening, all. I am Professor Jennifer Harrison Howard, and welcome to week one concept recording. Let's get started. You guys, when you, um, before you listen to these recordings, just make sure you have a solid understanding of the chapters. It'll really help when you um, listen to the lectures. So let's go ahead and get started. Our chapter one. And so let's go ahead and get started here. So then again, chapter one is really your foundation for everything that we'll be discussing here today. We're gonna to go into community and um, prevention oriented practice. And so the objectives we'll cover in our lecture here today. And before you do your readings, make sure you read the objectives. And after your reading, just go back and make sure you understand the concepts. So public health as a broad field of practice, which is the backbone of the infrastructure supporting the health of our United States, our states, our provinces, our towns, and our country. During the COVID pandemic, everyone became familiar, should have been familiar with, with public health. In this chapter, we'll delve in deeper into what it is as a practice, the population health, and the public health nursing. So a little bit of background, in 1988, the Institute of Medicine published this report that has been seen as the most, one of the most important documents for public health um, as far as um, prevention is concerned and the health of the population, population. It is what we are as a society, what we do collectively to ensure the conditions of which people try to be healthy. We help them to be as healthy as possible. The community stated that the mission of public health was to generate organized community efforts to address the public's interest and to um, apply that scientific and technical knowledge. And then this is usually accomplished by two broad groups, public and private sectors, uh, individuals with special functions in the government. So then looking at the benefits in an effort to, to help the public better understand the role of public health, what has played an in increase in life expectancy. Back in 1999, the Centers for Disease Control came out with the 10 great public health achievements in the 20th century. And then we have made gains in the area of public health, such as sewage disposals and provision of safe waters. We really made vast improvements in the public health that we know of today. And then keep in mind that as the United States, we're considered a developed country, but we only, we only put up to 3% um, of the amount of money that we spend um, as a government goes towards health, um, national health. And so they imagine how many more benefits the United States might see if we basically spent more money on healthcare. And so now we're gonna look into assessment policy, development, and insurance. So when you're looking at assessment, you this is where you systematically look at collecting data on the population that you're interested in, monitoring the population's health status, and making information available for the community. So your policy development refers to the need to provide leadership in developing those policies to help your population be as healthy, healthy as possible, and assurance refers to the role of public health in ensuring that essential community-oriented health services are available. And so looking at this slide is very important. They're all important, but there are 10 essential services of public health that came about with the U.S. Public Health Service, which happens to be the organization that I work for. And it was developed to emphasize the population focus essential public health functions and services that have been the most effective in improving the health care of the population. So make sure you know those. And then they also came up with this pyramid for levels of health care services. And these services focus on disease prevention, health promotion and protection on primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention services. And here we go. These are three areas that you want to be aware of. Primary health care, both primary care and public health services, 
that are designed to meet the basic needs of the community. Secondary health care services designed to detect and treat at the early stages and tertiary is designed to limit the progression of disease disability. You'll hear those three terms throughout the entire semester, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And so they identify 72 competencies divided into eight categories and three levels or tiers of practice. That's in figure 1.1 in your text, and you want to make sure that you have a solid understanding of those. It was developed to assure a well-trained, competent workforce and a strong evidence-based public health infrastructure. So tier one, you'll learn about applies to entry-level public health professionals. Tier two, competencies are expected in those with management and supervisory. And then tier three for those senior managers as well. And so the Quad Council Coalition had a role in developing these core competencies for public health professionals. And these are listed other agencies that have been responsible with them. Make sure that we're providing quality um, public health professionals that are competent and well-trained. And so looking into a population focus approach, you want to look into planning, delivering, evaluating various interventions as being used in an effort to achieve better outcomes. And that's what your focus is. Your focus is on better outcomes in the population that you're trying to serve, and how can you go about accomplishing that? You wanna look, look at the definitions here, um, population health is the health status of a defined population. Let's say your defined population are Native Americans. And then we have these different healthy people, 20, 30 um, objectives to help us carry out these goals. And then you focus on box 1.4, list of principles on which public health nursing is built. So make sure you have an understanding of that as well. Now, this slide describes characteristics that distinguish public health nursing as a specialty. Why is it different than any other type of nursing? Well, number one is population focused, community oriented, health and prevention focused, interventions that are at the community and not just the individual. We're concerned with the health of all the members of our population and not just one person. So community-oriented nursing can focus either on the community or on individual families and groups. And um, so just keep that in mind, but look at the population as a collection of individuals in a defined geographic area. So let's just say it's a reservation, that's an easy example to remember. You may be looking at subpopulations within that population you define. Let's say you're looking at children within that population as well. And then you want to focus on um, figure 1.4, which goes over the arenas for healthcare practice. Um, and remember that there's different goals that are defined as well if you're working with communities that you want to have a good understanding of. But there are challenges because there's barriers to nurses specializes in public health. And so we wanna continue to, con to develop our leaders and make sure that they're competent and they take care of the communities based on these competencies and skills that they've been trained for. So that's your chapter one. Going into chapter two. Okay, so your chapter two, let's go into that as well. So your chapter two, we're gonna be talking about the history of... Alexa, stop.
your history of public health and public health community nursing. So let's delve into a little bit deeper here. We have our objectives, make sure you have an understanding of those. And let's go into what we're gonna deal with for chapter two, which is the history. So we can understand what has influenced the development of public health and community health nursing. Started way back when ancient Babylonians need to, they need to understand hygiene, following with the Egyptians as well and going into the industrial revolution, all has influenced our early public health. So then you look at the colonial period and the new republic. At first it was family friend system of care. Then it evolved into an established system of care turned out for the aged and the mentally ill. And this progressed until we have our beloved Florence Nightingale who organized hospital nursing in 1946. And then in the 1870s, the first nursing schools and what have you. So make sure you guys have an understanding of your history. So then Jesse um, Sweet Scales was the first African-American public health nurse. You have the American Red Cross and its rural nursing services and um, school nursing all starting to arise here in the turn of the century. And then again in 1909, throughout the 1900s, we started having visiting nurses and nurses that were um, forming the public health nursing organizations in 1922. And then you have your wars that come in with World War I, need for public health nurses to stay in the United States and focus on the health care of those not serving. And then you have the influenza pandemic, which, which swept across the United States. And then churches and Red Crosses and all were involved in containing it. Your frontier nursing service, which is actually the school that I attended for my nurse practitioner in Kentucky, and Mary Breckenridge with her nurses on horseback. Then we're going into challenges of those nurses such as the African-American nurses taking care of the segregated South and also with lower salaries in the South compared to their, their um, white counterparts. Moving on to the Great Depression and the different acts that came into play such as the FERA and the Federal Emergency Relief and Civil Works Administration. All these programs help to, to design to have a community focus and to help those public health nurses provide the care that they need. Then you're going into um, the World War II up until the 1970s, where the 50s were starting to live longer. Okay, we have those organizations that are designed to help us here, the nursing associations and the like. Public health nursing became a required part of most baccalaureate programs in the 50s, yay. And then it continued to evolve from there. And then in 1979, we have our healthy people that came about and was proposed as a national strategy to improve significantly the health of Americans. And then we had our Affordable Care Acts to help those that are not insured or, or to help them get become insured and access that health care, preventative health care that they need to live longer. And then we have COVID and COVID um, it goes into the history of where um, we first had our cases in China and how up until 2020, it was declared a virus. Uh, the virus was declared a pandemic since uh, March of 2020. And we're still dealing with, with COVID today. So looking into the future, we need to learn from the past and also avoid those pitfalls so that we can um, continue to grow in our profession and realizing that um, for many years to come, we just need to uh, make sure that we, we utilize those lessons that we learned from the past so that we can grow in our profession as public health individuals. And then again, now we're going into, let's see, let's talk a little bit, let's see. Let's go into U.S. and global health care. Make sure, again, you, you have an understanding of your objectives and that after you read, go back and look at your objectives so you have an understanding. So this chapter really gets into the health care system, how it's transitioned, it's struggled, and everything that has gone through. Um, demographic trends, social and health force trends, and technology trends. So when you're looking at the population, 
Greatest growth is in honestly in the undeveloped countries. Decreased growth in the United States and other developed countries as the US total fertility rate has actually declined. Our baby boomers are getting older. Uh, Hispanic persons outnumber African-American as the largest economic group. Decline in mortality. Um, overall, the last century, the leading cause of death has shifted from infectious to chronic diseases. Our lifestyle has changed. We're trying to be healthier and take care of ourselves. Um, shifting the values, changing the importance of financial success, rising household incomes. There's been some patterns that have affected public health. And then again, um, we have to be, be cognizant of the changing types of services. There are, especially during COVID, beds were just reduced and the reduced capacity as well can affect the community. If you have someone ill and there's no place for them to go, many hospital services were diminished because of COVID. And then, so that it as well has affected. And then keep in mind too that, um, how we surveillance, we'll talk a little bit about it with our electronic health breakers, but we are looking at improving the disease surveillance so we can be aware of outbreaks. So looking at cost, access, and quality, despite the many advances in sophistication, we are in the United States, we're still plagued with problems related to cost, access, and qualities. They've, these problems have been affected by the ability of, of folks to access health care, quality health care that they need. The cost is a major issue with aging baby boomers generating the leading increase in our Medicare expenditure. Um, the Affordable Health Care Act has helped folks to be able to purchase health care. So those are good things to be aware of as well. And then we have there are two class of systems of private insurance, those who have insurance who can pay for it, and then public, those who depend on public funding for their health care. And the working poor are those who do not qualify for public funds because they make too much money. And then looking into quality, the Air is Human uh, report that came out in the 2000s from the Institute of Medicine really defined, helped us define and made it clear that the majority of medical errors today were not produced by provider negligence, lack of education or training. It was because of the nurse's role in, in about the nurse's role in the workload is affecting the client safety, just overburdened and overworked. And so looking into the different types of uh, organizations of healthcare, your primary care, so first level private healthcare is delivered in a variety of settings, like let's just say your doctor's office. And your public health system is mandated through laws, think of immunizations for children. And then primary care further defined deals with the most common needs of a members of members of a community, comprehensive and coordinated care. And then you're looking at managed care, your Medicare and your Medicaid for individuals such as the elderly or disabled. You have your local level health departments mandated. You have your state and federal regulations that they have to follow. The United States Department of Health and Human Services, the agency most heavily involved with the health and welfare of the United States. And then you have state health departments and you have local health departments, each with design rules to follow. So then looking at integration of public and primary care services, the Q suggested World Health Organization that integrating primary care and public health into a primary health care system will be the basis for better health care for all those involved. And that um, further defining it, this includes a variety of services, like making sure folks are vaccinated, have access to family planning and screenings with the minimal cost involved. And that these primary health care services is essential to improving the health of all communities involved. And that providing primary health care it's broader than just primary care. You're looking at making sure that those services are available to everyone that wants them. And then the International Council of Nursing is a leadership for change as far as to taking leadership role and helping achieve better health for all. So they're at the forefront of that. And then looking at the de uh, determinants of health. 
The determinants of health refers to the health status of a defined population of individuals. These determinants, making sure that they have, what are, that, what are those determinants that are affecting their health? The income, the social, the education, the environment, the socio social environment, the biology, the genetics, all of those affect someone's health. So as nurses, we are at, we're leaders. We're considered as leaders, leaders, especially your professional registered nurse. You'll be looked upon to be role models for improving the health care of the population. You have um, the Healthy People 2030 as a great framework, all of the healthy peoples that are further defined every decade for you to help, to help you to be aware of the indicators that are um, being focused on. So the delivery of the healthcare from um, in the United States, the American Nurses Association, they've been involved. We've been advocates and involved in debates for many, 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 many years um, as far as um, the, the delivery of healthcare that we are an integral part of. We wanna make sure that um, folks have, um, children have access to healthcare, it's affordable and available to any and everyone. And now let's get into Now we're gonna get into our chapter nine, evidence-based practice. Evidence-based practice is so important to everything that we do. So let's get started, you guys. These are the objectives that are listed for you as well. And then let's go into the, um, what is, what is evidence-based practice? It's defined back in 1996 as the conscientious, that means you're making, you're becoming aware of, of the explicit and judicious use of the best evidence in making decisions that you come into, when you're using your interventions, you're backing it consciously by this most relevant and sound evidence that's out there. You're not going to Wikipedia when you're designing your programs. And then again, the evolution started with the Nurse Child Assessment Satellite Project. You hear about the, you'll read about the paradigm shift in the 90s. And then current literature focuses on the application in acute and primary care settings. Now there's different types of evidence. Um, there's a hierarchy. Your double-blinded randomized controls trials, that's what you really want. But it's hard to perform these in community settings. So you may see non-randomized clinical trials or quasi trials or case control trials, but just know that your, your gold standard is your double-blinded randomized control trial. And that factors that implement. So once you, you have your evidence-based practice, you may have barriers to carrying it out because frankly, nurses may be reluctant to changing how they view what they, what they know, even if you have the evidence, there may be cost associated with it or compliance or different issues. But the steps involved in evidence base is it starts off with your clinical question, your PCOP, your population of interest, your I for intervention, the C is for comparison, outcome, and time frame. So that's what your PCOP stands for. That's how you develop your clinical question. Then you go into your systematic reviews of the research that's out there in the literature. You perform a meta-analysis where you take all these reviews and you, you summarize them, so to speak. And then you there's different levels, grades of um, evidence, the quality, you want good quality. What are the results? 
how can the results be applied to clinical care? These are the questions you want to ask yourself when you're looking at um, research. And then evaluating um, quality of evidence to make clinical decisions. You want to look at the outcomes, the size. These are all of the things that's lifted, listed on the slide when you're analyzing someone else's research before you decide, like, okay, this is good quality stuff. So you want to recognize current status of your own practice as far as implementing. Is it a place to where you can implement? Um, look at the cost associated with it. Um, you look at all of the uh, the distribution of healthcare resources, all of those current perspectives to keep in mind. So healthy people were now on 2030. Again, offers a systematic approach to healthcare improvement, health improvement. The objectives for improving clients' understanding for evidence-based practices listed as well. The Minnesota model, as far as public health nursing, came around in 1994. So many folks in public health go to the, and use this model, the, the Minnesota model for a lot of the things that they do even today, because they've been around so long and they've started using evidence-based practice many, many, many years before everyone else. So these are their 17 interventions. Make sure that you know them. I won't read them for you, you can read them. And then the different uh, interventions listed in the previous slide, the following actions are taking place. Interventions defined, we're looking at well, the assumptions that our interventions are given. We're looking at everything that's listed there for you. And so realize too that evidence base, you want, you want, anytime you have a program, you want to make sure or any intervention that is backed by sound evidence, not something that you just heard about or you found. Because this is folks' lives that we're dealing with here. So you want to make sure you give them the best possible um evidence. All right, so health quality and health equality and care of vulnerable populations. Know your objectives and have an understanding. So delving, delving into this chapter deals, details the nurses use of the nursing process with vulnerable population groups and presents case examples to identify how nurses can help individuals. So there's a lot of cases that they talk about in chapter 23 as well. But just know that during 2020 with the onset of COVID, it just changed everything, but not in a negative way. The pandemic and the demonstrations and riots, importance of equity were really put on the forefront. Um, going into health, equal, health equity defined by Robert Wood Johnson is everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthier. This requires removing obstacles to help, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs, fair pay, quality education, housing, safety, environments, and health care. So make sure you know the definitions. Population health again is the focus on public, it's the focus of all public health nurses. It's an approach to health that aims to improve the health of the entire population, not one person. And so you define your population again by geography, enrollment, common characteristics. It really depends on what you're depends on what you're trying to define for your population. That's where you're going to start with first. Who are you working with? And so determinants of health, there's seven who factors, world health organizations. You want to look at income and social status, education, physical environment social support networks, genetics, health services, gender, all of those impact someone's health. There are five domains of social determinants of health, such as economic stability, education, access and quality, healthcare access and quality neighborhoods and built environments and social and community contexts, such as safe housing, transportation, racism, discrimination, violence, job opportunities and income and the like. All of those can affect someone's health and well being. So, Healthy People 2030, when it's discussing vulnerable population, because those that are underserved and disadvantaged have fewer resources for promoting the health, even if they wanted to live healthier lives. And so, those are the things that we need to work on for our vulnerable populations our children, our ages, our, age, our um, elders, our homeless. 
Um, these groups have increased risk for adverse health outcomes. Uh, they're more likely than the general population to suffer from health disparities, to say like COVID-19. And then they're more likely to develop health problems because of that lack of access, um, more sensitive to risk factors because they are often exposed to cumulative risk factors, let's say comorbidities, diabetes, the like. And so poverty itself is a primary cause of vulnerability and is a growing problem in the United States. The chronic stress of factors such as poverty and poor education and unemployment, the disenfranchised really is, just creates a vicious cycle. And then again, your special needs group, the age, both the young and the old across the continuum, um, the military and their family, your homeless vets, um, persons with disabilities are all a special subset. So you have different programs in place, um, public policies affecting the vulnerable populations, such as the Social Security. It's the largest federal support program for elderly Americans. You have Medicare, Medicaid, you have Title, um, you have Title 21 of the Social Security Act, which provides for state health insurance for children. All of those programs listed there on the slide for you to try to help with the improve the access for vulnerable population um, to get the care that they need. And then you have wraparound services available, such for social and economic services that can help, uh, uh, such as referrals, through referrals, they can get additional help from social services and different agencies to help with social justice and advocacy and what have you. So primary prevention, an example for a vulnerable population, make sure they get vaccinated for, let's say, influenza, screening for TB, um, and groups, uh, therapy groups for those with mentally ill, um, uh, mentally ill adults. And then nurses who work as partners with vulnerable clients to identify their strengths and needs and interventions it's really, it really is challenging, but it it's definitely can be done as a rewarding work. But never, ever, 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 when you're planning and implementing care, show respect, do not make assumptions. You never know what happened to put that person in any type of position. Develop your support system, your other community groups, you're gonna need them, advocate, know the resources that are available. And in the end, they, you know, the services that we provide as public health nurses, especially with our vulnerable populations, cannot be underrated. It is a wonderful service to be um, to to be available to those that really do truly they you know need our help in our services that we can provide. And so, you guys, that concludes our week one concepts. I will see you in class. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.